for most of us possibly consider ourselves to be left-leaning that um, and we're used to hearing the right criticize the left but when a very strong voice on the left starts to criticize the left we better listen up and so I'm going <laughs> to hand you over to a voice that's going to do that and uh, thank you Eve for coming um, yeah so this is a uh, tour from my latest book Left, right, marching to the beat of Imperial Canada, which is trying to answer 10% of a question. Uh, um, it's not a very impressive book. Uh, the 10% <laughs> the of the question is trying to answer is why are Canadians so confused about this country's role in the world? Why do we believe that Canada is a force for good in the world, overwhelmingly, despite Canadian foreign policy being about advancing empire, historically British, today American, and advancing Canadian corporate interests. That's overwhelming what drives Canadian foreign policy, but we believe that this country is about peacekeeping, internationalism, benevolence, etc. The 90% of the question of why we're so confused, I tried to answer in my previous book, A Propaganda System, How Canada's Government, Corporations, Media, and acad Academia Sell War and Exploitation. And so that book looked at the major institutions of propaganda within our society. So it looked at, obviously, the dominant media. It looked at the biggest public relations entity in the country, the Canadian military. It looked at the, some of the academic institutions that are set up by, you know, the founder of Barrett Gold, set up the Monk School of Global Affairs at the University of Toronto, one of the most important institutions of, of international relations in academia. And so it, that dealt with the main institutions. This book, which was initially conceived of as part of a propaganda system, deals with how the left and left institutions have gone along with the, the dominant narrative about Canadian foreign policy and have, have, have too often uh, uh, supported unjust foreign policy moves um, by, our, by our government and in, in the process have confused us about our place in the world. So the book begins with a look at the NDP CCF foreign policy. A uh, historical look uh, shows how the NDP supported the creation of NATO in 1949. NATO being uh, a tool of bringing the, the uh, colonized world uh, under the US-led geopolitical umbrella. Uh, the CCF supported the Korean War in the early 1950s, where millions of people were killed. The CCF has a long history, CCF NDP, has a long history of supporting Canada's role in Palestinian dispossession. In the mid-1970s, after the Palestinian Liberation Organization was uh, granted observer status at the UN, the, there was supposed to be a UN conference in Toronto in 1975, and the NDP, uh, notably the NDP in Ontario, called for that conference to, be, uh, to not take place in Toronto because PLO representatives may attend. The conference had nothing to do with Palestine. Just the basis that PLO representatives may attend the conference, no, we don't want this conference taking place in our province. Uh, one highly symbolic example among many of the NDP uh, opposing Palestinian rights uh, more recently, Hélène Lavadière, the NDP uh, foreign critic in 2016, she spoke at the APEC conference, the main pro-Israel organization in the U.S. Uh, when she was in Israel in 2016, they paid for APEC, paid for her to speak in Washington. Uh, uh, when she was in Israel in 2016, she went to an event put on by the Jewish National Fund, the Jewish National Fund being an explicitly racist organization that excludes non-Jews, from the territory that they, they control, 13% of Israeli land. Um, and you have the NDP foreign critic uh, uh, going to a JNF event when she was in Israel. And there are many, uh, many, many other examples. And I'll go into more detail on that, that question of NDP Palestine um, on, on Saturday. In Venezuela today, we have a campaign against uh, elected government in Venezuela there are legitimate criticisms of that government, no doubt. There are major self-inflicted wounds of that government. Uh, 
But you have a campaign being waged to destabilize and overthrow that government where you have Donald Trump, a year ago, openly talking about an invasion, bringing it up when he talked to the Colombian president. Why should we think about invading uh, Venezuela? Uh, you have uh, multiple rounds of sanctions by the US and by Canada. Three rounds of sanctions against the Venezuelan government. Unilateral sanctions, of course, contravene the UN Charter. Canada bringing three rounds of sanctions. Uh, you have the Canadian government going around pressuring governments in the Caribbean to join the onslaught against the government in Venezuela. And you have no response from the NDP. The NDP doesn't put up any opposition to this campaign that our government is waging against the government in Venezuela. Um, in fact, it's worse than that. They're egging them on. Back in 2013, Ellen Lavadier, before she was uh, uh, a foreign critic, she, de she was deputy foreign critic, she called for, she, she, she complained that the, the Harper government wasn't being hard enough on Venezuela. In 2016, Lavadier put out a press release, quote, bemoaning the erosion of democracy, calling on Canada to, quote, defend democracy in Venezuela. In 2017, before a House of Commons Parliamentary Committee meeting, Lavadier referred to Venezuelan vice president as a, quote, a drug lord for whom, open quote, the American government has seized billions of dollars of his assets for drug trafficking. Billions. Does anyone believe that they seized billions of dollars of assets from the vice president of Venezuela? I mean, this is, this is outlandish, hard right Venezuelan kind of rhetoric. And here you have the NDP foreign critic in the House of Commons uh, making these uh, claims. Militarism has been an issue that the NDP has very much uh, endorsed and endorsed Canadian wars way too often. So uh, one recent example of that was with regards to Libya in 2011. The NDP voted for two different House of Commons votes supporting the bombing of Libya. Canadian general led the bombing, Canadian fighter jets. Uh, the bombing uh, contravened the UN resolution 1973, which called for a, uh, a um, uh, no-fly zone to protect civilians, and then they basically bombed on, you know, in service of regime change. They expanded the, the UN resolution. Canadian forces on the ground in Libya, contravention, explicit contravention of UN resolution. Canada sold weapons to the, to the opposition explicit contravention of UN resolution. And yet you had the NDP supporting this. And this is how uh, Jack Layton uh, said before the bombing, as the bombing was started, he said, quote, it's appropriate for Canada to be part of this effort to try to stop Gaddafi from attacking his citizens as he has been threatening to do. After Gaddafi was killed, NDP interim leader Nicole Tourmel said, quote, the future of Libya now belongs to all Libyans. Our troops have done a wonderful job in Libya over the past few months. Well, look at Libya today. Absolute catastrophe, right? They got hundreds of different arms groups, major political violence between different armed factions. Uh, the African Union at the time explicitly opposed the, the, the NATO bombing campaign because they said it would destabilize Libya and the region, which is precisely what has happened, destabilizing much of the Sahel region of, of Africa. Now, you know, even our mission in Mali today is in large part an outgrowth of that destabilization because that the war moved uh, moved south after Gaddafi was killed. So militarism is a is a big issue uh, with the NDP, and um, since at least the early two thousands, the NDP has consistently supported Canadian military spending. Many examples of that. A stark example was last June. Okay, last June, the Liberal Party put out a defense policy statement calling for more special forces who were involved in all kinds of you know, assassination missions in Afghanistan and elsewhere. Uh, it called for offensive cyber attack capabilities, called for um, uh, armed drones, and most notably called for increasing Canadian military spending by 70% over 10 years. The NDP defense critic here in this city, Randall Garrison, his response to this was to say what? It was to say, we want more of that money now. Too much of that 70% is over the 10 years. Too much is later on in the 10 years. 
And he would, Garrison criticized uh, the liberals from, the, from a militarist perspective on multiple occasions, multiple different uh, venues. The second section of the book deals with labor unions and what labor unions foreign policy. And, and my main criticism of labor unions foreign policy today is not unlike the NDP, that they directly support Canadian imperialism, but mostly that they're quiet. They, for the most part, the progressive labor unions, the, 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 uh, the major progressive-ish labor unions mostly just stay quiet. There, there are some exceptions. Sometimes you know, the Canadian Union of Postal Workers being an example a bit more on the activist end and, and does engage in some criticism of Canadian foreign policy. But for the most part, it's just quietness. And, and this, this point was really rammed home to me about two months ago when the Ontario Federation of Labor had a 14-page supplement in the Toronto Star that, uh, that dealt, that was uh, the affiliates of the, of the unions, of the OFL, of the um, Ontario Federation of Labor, they were basically portraying the labor movement in the most progressive light in this supplement in the Toronto Star, talking about how the labor movement is fighting against racism and fighting in favor of indigenous rights, uh, in favor of LGBTQ rights, pushing for a farmer care program, pushing for a higher minimum wage. This was really the labor movement presenting itself not just as, as an institution that protects the members, but sort of as you know, class-based institutions, the most progressive kind of light of, of, of uh, what the labor movement does. In that 14-page broadsheet supplement, there were 10 words about the rest of the world. And that was a little mention of legislation in New Zealand where people who are victimized in domestic abuse can get some time off. Nothing about uh, the rest of the world besides that, and not, certainly nothing about you know, challenging Canadian foreign policy towards the rest of the world. So, so this, is, this would be my main criticism of labor unions today, is that they, they basically they don't engage in, in, in taking on the, uh, unlike on domestic issues, where they do provide somewhat of a counterweight to the corporate agenda. On foreign policy, they basically let the corporations do whatever they want, let the state do whatever they want. Uh, now, historically, it was something very different. And until uh, into the 1970s, at least, the labor movement was very much tied into supporting uh, Canadian imperialism. And uh, one of the things I did for this book was I read uh, all the back issues, the early issues of the C Canadian Congress Journal, which was the Journal of the Trades and Labor Congress, which merged with the Canadian Congress of Labor to, to create the Canadian Labor Congress in 1956. And the Canadian Congress Journal, uh, among a number of different examples, but in the, in the Caribbean, writing about the Caribbean in the 1920s, was very much supportive of Canadian corporate policy Canadian power in the Caribbean. So one story talked about Canadian trading and financial interests have become well established throughout the islands, referring to Canadian banking domination in the Caribbean and referring to it in a positive light. Well, Canadian banking domination in the Caribbean is an issue that was and is controversial among many people in the Caribbean. Another story from the 19, 1929 said, quote, for well over 100 years, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick traders and sailors established contact with the islands, bringing Canadian fish and produce in exchange for fruits, sugar, and other products. What the Canadian Congress Journal is referring to is the, the relationship between the Atlantic provinces of, of selling cod to the plantation, the slave plantations, to keep people working 16 hours a day. So cod from the Atlantic region um, the, good, the good cod went to Europe, and the, refu the refuse fish was sent to the uh, slave plantations because the plantation owners didn't want to, to uh, devote their land to growing food stuff for their slaves, but they needed a source of cheap, high-protein fuel to keep people working 16 hours a day. So that's the economic relationship that began in the Atlantic, with the Atlantic with the Caribbean, which you have a Canadian uh, Union journal portraying in this very positive light, something, of course, that most people in the Caribbean would probably not view in quite, uh, quite as positive of, of, of a light. Uh, the the uh, Canadian, uh, Canadian Con Congress of Labor and Trades and Labor Congress both supported the creation of NATO. 
It wasn't until 1976 that the CLC called for de-emphasizing the role of the North Atlantic Organization, supported the war in Korea. The CLC supported the 1961 U.S. orchestrated invasion of Cuba, so-called Bay of Pigs invasion. Ed Finn, in his book, talks about being an editor at a newspaper funded by the Canadian Labor Congress in Newfoundland that wrote an article critical of U.S. policy in Cuba, and the response from the CLC was to cut off all the funding for the newspaper, and the, and the newspaper uh, collapsed. The CLC supported the, the, uh, the uh, UN mission in the Congo in the early 1960s, where Canadians played an important role in, with the assassination of Patrice Lumumba. The Canadian labor movement has a vicious anti-Palestinian history. Yeah, the first convention, 19, 1956 convention, of the CLC, they called on Canada to sell weapons to Israel and called on Canada to pressure other governments to sell weapons to Israel. I don't think that, I, probably the only time the Canadian Labor Federation ever called on Canada to sell weapons to anyone. Um, and, uh, and that anti-Palestinian history continued on. Uh, it's changed a lot, fortunately, the last 15, 20 years, but continued on in subsequent uh, decades. Probably the last of the real anti-Palestinian prominent labor leaders was Buzz Hargrove, the former head of the Canadian Auto Workers. In 2006, Buzz Hargrove went to Israel with Heather Reisman and Jerry Schwartz. Heather Reisman and Jerry Schwartz being the, the uh, two major donors that helped to get rid of the Canadian Jewish Congress to create the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs as just a, you know, even harder line pro-Israel lobby organization. So for the most part, the labor movement hasn't supported, uh, that, that no longer supports Canadian imperialism. Uh, it's mostly just a question of, 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 of disengaging. And, and disengaging is not acceptable, of course, because that doesn't mean the corporations don't disengage, the state doesn't disengage. It's still a, a, you know, still a policy being pursued. Uh, but there is at least one important example of Canadian labor movement supporting imperialism in recent years. And that was after the coup in Haiti in 2004, or actually before the coup, but around the coup of 2004. And the Quebec labor unions very much supported that policy. The Fédération des Travailleurs et Travailleuses du Québec, the main federation, the CLC's partner in Quebec, uh, in, in the midst of the CIA-backed thugs going after the elected Aristide government in mid-February uh, mid 2004, the FTQ participated in the delegation, criticized the Aristide government, and then after Aristide was ousted, they, call, they put out a press release calling on the international community to, quote, help Haitians build democracy in their country. That, of course, was the international community that had just overthrown democracy in Haiti. And the FTQ would support, uh, uh, to a large extent, the violence, the political violence, where thousands of people were killed in the two years aftermath of the coup in, in Haiti. The third section of the book deals with major institutions on the left, some think tanks on the left, and, and prominent uh, individuals, commentators on the left. So one of the institutions is the Rideau Institute. The Rideau Institute is headed up by, by somebody by the name of Peggy Mason. Peggy Mason was Joe Clark, who was Brian Mulroney's uh, foreign minister uh, in the, through the 1980s. Peggy Mason was top advisor to Joe Clark during that period. Peggy Mason has had, sorry, I should back up. The Rideau Institute is the, is the only left-wing foreign policy think tank in this country, based in Ottawa, mostly focused on the military side of, military side of foreign policy, not less the diplomatic side. And so Peggy Mason was a uh, advisor to Joe Clark. She's had a number of positions within the official foreign affairs over the past three decades. In 2012, Peggy Mason told a, a parliamentary committee meeting, quote, I'm talking as someone who has spent the better part of the last 10 years working with NATO. And her LinkedIn profile uh, continued to suggest that as, as of a couple months ago. She provided peacekeeping training for NATO forces. So the head of the only left-wing foreign policy think tank in this country talks about how she works for NATO, okay? which I think tells you a lot about the scope of, of, uh, of, uh, of discussion, the, the extent to which the Rideau Institute uh, puts a challenge to Canadian foreign policy. Now, the main person that the Rideau Institute's work they promote is somebody, somebody by the name of Walter Dorn. 
People familiar with Walter Dorn? Some people? No one? So if there's a story in the Globe and Mail or on the CBC about peacekeeping, Walter Dorn is usually quoted. He is the biggest proponent of peacekeeping in this country. He is a professor at the Royal Military College at Kingston and at the Canadian Forces College. So, which are both run by, of course, by the Department of National Defense. And uh, Walter Dorn's uh, perspective on uh, uh, Canadian foreign policy is basically just more peacekeeping. Okay? He's had a position with the uh, UN Department of Peacekeeping Operations. In fact, he, he had a position in Haiti in the aftermath of the coup. So the coup becomes the Canadian troops who uh, invade Haiti in 2004, they, they become part of a UN mission and the UN occupies Haiti until very recently. Walter Dorn had a position with the UN peacekeeping mission in Haiti and uh, uh, justifies, justified the UN mission in Haiti, justified, the, ignores the UN's role uh, in the ouster of the elected president and justifies the UN's political violence even. He writes uh, uh, positively about the UN's role going into Cité Soleil, the biggest slum neighborhood in Port-au-Prince, uh, bastion of support for Aristide, and, and uh, suppressing, uh, attempting to go after, as, as they put it, gang leaders. But in the worst instance, on July 6, 2005, they killed 23 uh, innocent civilians, mostly women and children, and you can actually watch people dying on camera in Kevin Pina's very powerful film about the post-coup violence in Haiti. So Walter Doran had an had a, had a official position with the UN force that Canada was part of. That's probably the worst imperial crime that Canada participated in this century. And Walter Doran prom promoted the UN mission in Haiti, promoted Canada's partic participation in the UN mission in Haiti. In 2011, he told CBC that the world is, quote, crying for Canada to expand its role in UN missions. We have a long-standing police contribution in Haiti, but we could easily contribute to the military side. So a strong proponent of Canada's role in, in Haiti in the mid-2000s and after. In his writing about Canada's role in the UN, and he's written a lot about Canada's role in the UN, Walter Dorn is always calling for more peacekeeping. So he goes about basically whitewashing the whole history of UN peacekeeping and how UN peacekeeping in some cases has been part of imperialism. So when he writes about the UN mission in the Congo in the early 1960s, Walter Dorn ignores the role the UN played in the assassination of Patrice Lumumba, the elected independence leader. He also writes in a wildly uh, one-sided uh, explanation of the UN mission in Korea in the early 1950s. This is what Walter Dorn says about the mission in Korea. He says, quote, Canada sent a large contingent of troops to Korea in 1950 to fight in a UN police action to protect the elected South Korean government. Anybody who knows anything about what, what went on before the Korean War knows that that is an incredibly pro-American description of, of the situation in Korea. Right? The Rhee government had killed tens of thousands of people before what we call, mostly leftists, before what we call the Korean War began. Right? Washington had worked to divide the country, et cetera, et cetera. But Walter Dorn's basic position is UN peacekeeping is ipso facto good. So therefore, he's, he describes the whole history of Canadian UN peacekeeping basically as a benevolent affair. And that, of course, confuses us about Canada's role, uh, real history of Canadian uh, uh, foreign policy. So the book, uh, the third section deal has, deals with the Rideau Institute, the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, and some prominent commentators, people like uh, Michael Byers, people around here may be familiar with him, uh, obviously Walter Dorn, I have a section on Romeo, Romeo Dallaire, uh, a, a section on uh, Linda McQuaig, and a section on uh, Stephen Lewis. So Stephen Lewis is uh, the man of Africa in this country, right? What got me going on Stephen Lewis was during the 2015 tour for my book, Canada and Africa, 300 Years of Aid and Exploitation, uh, I was on a bus between uh, Lethbridge and Nelson, overnight bus, and I came across a story where Stephen Lewis, is be, this was during the election campaign of 2015 for the Harper, the Harper government, fortunately lost. 
And Stephen Lewis was asked about Harper's policy in Africa. And his criticism of Harper's policy in Africa was that Harper wasn't doing enough on the continent. I was on a book tour with one of the political objectives of the book tour to point out how Harper had totally oriented Canadian policy on the continent to advancing the interests of Canadian mining companies. $30 billion in Canadian mining investment on the continent, and, and uh, Harper had moved diplomatic policy towards supporting mining, aid policy, signing foreign investment promotion protection agreements, allowing Canadian companies to sue African governments and international tribunal, oriented policy towards the mining interest. I was also pointing out that Harper's climate policy was a death sentence to ever more Africans. And that the, the war in Libya in 2011, which the African Union explicitly opposed, had been incredibly destabilizing for much of the Sahel region of the continent. The criticism wasn't that Canada wasn't, that Harper wasn't doing enough in Africa, but in fact that he was further exploiting the continent. So after coming across the story, I spent the rest of the bus ride, fortunately Greyhound, um, which, which is no longer with us, unfortunately, um, uh, at least on the West Coast, uh, I spent the rest of the bus, they have, they have Wi-Fi on the ground, I spent the rest of the bus reading everything I find about, about Stephen Lewis's uh, uh, commentary and writing about Canada's role in Africa. And what I found, and then I would continue on, of course, read his book and, and whatnot, uh, what I found is I didn't come across any criticism that Stephen Lewis made of Canada's role in Africa that wasn't do more. <laughs> All his criticism is Canada do more. Right? He ignores the role the Canadians played in late 1800s, early 1900s in conquering the continent for the British, militarily, hundreds of Canadians fighting. Canadians who were colonial governors of Ghana, of northern Nigeria, of Kenya, British colonial governors. The, the program that recruited students from uh, University of Toronto, McGill, Queens, to be part of the British colonial service in the 1920s. The, the billions, Canada provided $1.3 billion in NATO mutual assistance program weaponry, not, not sold, gave about $8 billion in today's money to the NATO, European NATO powers through the 1950s, right? While the French were doing what in Algeria, right? Canada was giving bullets to the French while there's 400,000 French troops in Algeria massacring independent struggle while the British were putting down the so-called Mau Mau revolt in Kenya, while the Belgians were suppressing independence uh, in, in, uh, in the Congo. Canada was giving them weaponry. None of this, of course, in Stephen Lewis's description of Canada's role in Africa. Nothing about Canada's role in providing tens, almost certainly over $100 million dollars in direct aid to support structural adjustment programs in Africa through the, through the 80s and 1990s, plus hundreds of millions of dollars of Canadian aid money via the IMF and the World Bank, and Canada pushing structural adjustment programs at the IMF and World Bank in Africa through that period. Uh, structural adjustment programs, of course, are about uh, opening countries' economies to foreign investors, cutting spending on education, healthcare, very devastating for, for populations all across the continent. Stephen Lewis, in his book, Race Against Time, does criticize structural adjustment programs, okay? He ignores Canada's role in the process. Well, maybe that's not a coincidence, because Stephen Lewis, of course, was Brian Mulroney's ambassador to the UN, and it was the Brian Mulroney government that brought in Canada's push for a structural adjustment in, in Africa. So it would be, to some extent, criticizing his own, his own, uh, his own government. Uh, but, St and, 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 if, and if you look at Stephen Lewis's his, his commentary on Canada's role in Africa, uh, uh, it's, it's an, it's, he regularly praises it. Right? While he never criticizes anything but more aid, he regularly praises it, most notably after Nelson Mandela died. Right? All over the media, one of the examples was Stephen Lewis describing, quote, the extraordinary role that Canada played in fighting apartheid. Total hogwash. Just total. I mean, he knows it too, of course. Right? He knows there were people standing outside the LCBO in Toronto for 20 years, 15 minimum, probably longer, 
calling on Canadians to boycott South African wines, right? He knows that full well. I'm sure he passed them, you know? Uh, he probably has, even knows people who did it. He knows that the, the uh, uh, Mulroney government only brought in partial sanctions against apartheid South Africa. He knows that there, in many other countries, Brazil, Scandinavian countries, broke off diplomatic relations. What you can say about Canada's rule in South Africa was that we were the best of a bad lot. That's the fair assessment. Yes, we were better than Britain, we were better than the US, we were better than Israel, maybe, maybe France, right? But to say that Canada was at the forefront of fighting apart, the African government's calling on the world to isolate South Africa going back to the late 1950s. Um, but Stephen Lewis is in this, in this praise Canada kind of, kind of uh, um, uh, lens. Now, it's, I think, quite illustrative or illuminating to contrast Stephen Lewis's reputation on domestic issues with international issues, okay? Stephen Lewis, at least for an older generation of people on the left, they have a lot of kind of hostility to Stephen Lewis's policies. While he was the head of the Ontario NDP from 1970 to 1978, he is considered the person to have played the major role in kicking out the waffle from the NDP. Right? The left-wing nationalist socialist movement within the NDP. So if you punch Stephen Lewis waffle into Google, there's a number of stories, some of which have been written even fairly recently, uh, critical of his role in that. Now, as Stephen Lewis moves to the international sphere, the criticism dries up. So first as Mulroney's ambassador to the UN, then as a UNICEF vice president, then as heading a uh, UN HIV AIDS position, then with the Stephen Lewis Foundation, the criticism basically dries up. The irony, though, from my perspective, is that I actually think I agree more with Stephen Lewis's domestic policy than I do with his foreign orientation. In essence, Stephen Lewis's foreign policy with regards to Africa is basically just one thing, more charity. That's essentially his position, right? He's prepared to criticize China's role in Africa, Zimbabwe. He criticizes geopolitical competitors, um, but his basic essence of his policy is more charity, right? How many people in this country want to have foreign private charities running our school system or education system? That's essentially what he's calling for in Africa. I mean, really, you get down to it, right? But we have a, so, so I actually, like I said, I think I have more, I'm, Stephen Lewis certainly wouldn't believe that for domestic policy. He wouldn't call for you know, charities to run our school system uh, or education or health system. So I think that I actually agree more with Stephen Lewis's domestic outlook than I do with his foreign policy outlook. And I think many people on the left would, would feel the same way if they kind of understood what he's really saying about uh, international affairs. But, the, but, but we have, and while, Conversely, he's very rarely criticized for his foreign policy. And I think the reason why, on domestic issues, the left has a culture of holding politicians and commentators to account for their policies, for their, if you, call, you want to call them sellouts, for their concessions to the dominant narrative. On foreign policy, particularly with regards to the, most, the weakest places of the world, we don't. Africa, of course, being high on the list of weak places in the world. So in that case, you just call for charity and people are, oh, that's saintly, that's great, just you know, cares about Africans. Uh, the politics are just kind of... Uh, um, so I, I think that looking at Stephen Lewis is contrasting his, uh, how he's perceived domestically versus internationally can be, uh, I think, says a lot about uh, political culture with regards to foreign policy. The fourth section of the book deals with the why question, right? Why are these institutions and these commentators conceding so much to the dominant narr narrative of Canadian foreign policy? Well, on the case of the individual commentator, someone like Linda McQuaig, right? She has a column in the Toronto Star, clearly the absolute best end of the corporate media. If Linda McQuaig was to start writing a column that had as a theme a constant theme, maybe she could do it one time, but as a, a regular theme, that the world needs less Canada in international affairs, right? Something that's, a, I think, factually overwhelming. If she made that her, a constant theme of her column, Linda McQuaig would no longer be a columnist at the Toronto Star, right? The, the parameters of debate in the, on the CBC 
in Toronto Star. You, CBC does not have people on that say the world needs less Canada in global affairs. Again, the facts, I think, are quite overwhelming uh, in that direction. So there's a, there's some, that's part of the explanation for at an individual level like that. There's uh, other, many other facets to the explanation. So, for instance, the NDP's foreign critic, Hélène Lavadière, she worked at Foreign Affairs for 15 years before being elected for the NDP. She actually won a, a prize for the best Canadian diplomat. And there are many different ways in which the uh, foreign affairs, that, in which MPs in Ottawa are, are drawn into the foreign affairs orbit. Right? Things like the Canadian Forces Parliamentary Program that bring MPs on, uh, bring them onto Canadian military bases, onto naval ships, to, you know, basically bring them close to the military's perspective. There's a whole series of different inter-parliamentary associations that again reinforce power imbalances in our world. There's the all expense paid trips, bringing MPs to different parts of the world. The, the most obvious example is with regards to Israel, right? The Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs brings MPs to Israel, certainly not to show the Palestinian perspective. 20, 20 NDP, in 2014, 20 NDP MPs, at least 20 NDP MPs, had been to Israel with Sija, right? So this is part of what shapes their perspective of international affairs. Also, there's, from the standpoint of labor unions, there's long ties between the Canadian Labor Congress and external affairs. And I detail a whole bunch of these different ties in the book, the most obvious example being that most of the Canadian Labor Congress's international funding has come from the Canadian International Development Agency, from the official Canadian aid agency, going back to the late uh, 60s. Obviously, that constrains their uh, international outlook, what they can say. And the, the Canadian Labour Congress has all kinds of ties to the to official uh, or to um, Canadian government-funded uh, foreign policy uh, think tanks, organizations in Ottawa. One notable example being the Canadian uh, Canadian Council of International Cooperation, the CCIC, the main <coughs> NGO umbrella group in this country. The CCIC was set up in the late 1960s with funding from the Canadian International Development Agency, in large part as a lobby organization to promote the Canadian aid budget. And the Canadian Labour Congress has had a position on the CCIC's board uh, for most of, this, most of the past half century. And just to give you a sense of the CCIC's international outlook, they held a con uh, convention in Ottawa about six or seven weeks ago. And this is the promotional material from the C CCIC's conference in Ottawa. It said, quote, Inspired by Justin Trudeau's 2015 proclamation, Canada is back. We are presenting panels that illustrate or challenge Canada's role in global leadership. Are we doing all that we could be doing in the world? Right? Are we doing all we could be doing in the world? What about the... Uh, the, the, the arms sales to the Saudi monarchy? What about Canada's role in voting against Palestinian rights at the UN? What about Canada's role in trying to overthrow the government of Venezuela? What about Canada's role in opposing nuclear arm, uh, uh, nuclear disarmament? What about Canada's role in putting troops on Russia's border? What about Trudeau government's role in, in, uh, in increasing military spending? The framing of the CCIC is always more we need more, not that we're doing all these things that are contributing to injustices in the world, but do more. Um, and that's the world in which the Canadian Labour Congress is tied into in, in, in Ottawa. Now, the, probably the main explanation, or maybe not the main explanation, but an important explanation in, in, in all this, uh, is the question of nationalism. And um, I deal with, a, I have a section of the book dealing with Quebecois nationalism, and I also have a section of the book dealing with how First Nations leadership have conceded to the dominant narrative on Canadian foreign policy. So even the primary victims of the Canadian state have upheld this country's foreign policy nationalism. But the main nationalism I want to deal with is the, is the, is the English-Canadian left variety. And an important part of this nationalism liberal nationalism, maybe call it, is this idea of Canada as a, um, a, a, a peacekeeper, a defender of peaceful internationalism. And you find that even when people on the left criticize Canadian warfare, they often do so from the lens of promoting peacekeeping and promoting benevolent Canada. 
So during the war in Afghanistan, Jack Layton said, quote, New Democrats have not written a blank check so that this government can drag Canada still farther into war, so that it can remove us farther from our role as international peacekeepers. So his criticism of Canada's role in Afghanistan is that it was moving us away from our role as peacekeepers. Or Walter Dorn, in even more explicit terms, quote, he said, quote, the first consequence of our current deployment in Afghanistan is that Canada is currently at a historic low in its UN peacekeeping contribution. I thought the first consequence of our war in Afghanistan was that we were occupying Afghanistan, not that we couldn't be involved in another moral crusade. But that's how Walter Dorn puts forward his criticism of Canada's role in Afghanistan. It, take, it took us away from our, our usual benevolent uh, 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 international role. Ian McKay and uh, Jamie Swift in their book, Warrior Nation, describe some of this liberal nationalist ideology and they, 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 where it comes from. They say, quote, the Ottawa men, referring to external affairs people, most notably Lester Pearson in the 1950s and 60s, said the Ottawa men developed a nationalist myth symbol complex about an imagined community outside Canada in which Canadians played an indispensable, indeed world reshaping role, placing them at the heart of the great crusade for peace and democracy. Right? This is an important part of the ideology of, 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 uh, of this country, and it's one that's very much upheld by people uh, far into the left. Now, when we talk about left nationalism, we need to interrogate a couple components. So one important component, this whole idea of Canada as a colony, right? First is a colony of Britain, today is a colony of the US. So was Canada a colony of Britain like Kenya was a colony of Britain? Right. Were the Europeans, the British, French, other settlers who who, who uh, basically been in political control of this country, were they dispossessed of their land like the Kikuyu were? Of course not. They dispossessed First Nations. Right. A big part of what what Canada was about at the time of Confederation was extending British power westward to Asia. Right. The, the naval base on Vancouver Island was set up in part to extend British power into Asia. The same thing with the railway. Um, so calling Canada a colony of Britain, uh, like India or Kenya was a colony of Britain, I think is, is quite misleading. More importantly, calling Canada a colony of the US, like s some on the left do, is incredibly misleading. So the Waffle, the left-wing movement within the NDP in the early 1970s, in their manifesto for a movement for an independent socialist Canada, referred to, quote, reduction of Canada to a colony of the United States. Or Bruce Campbell, the founder of the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, he said in 2014, he referred to Canada as a, quote, colonial supplicant. Well, was Canada, a, or Canada is or was, a colony of the US like Haiti? Right. Did, did American Marines march into Ottawa, go to the Bank of Canada, take all our gold reserves, march across the border, like they did in Port-au-Prince in 1914? Did they occupy Canada for 20 years, like they did in Haiti, and had kept control of the finances for another 13 or so, like they did in Haiti in the first half of the 1900s? Of course not. You can't compare U.S. dominance of Canada to basically any country in Central America, much of the Caribbean, or actually much of South, the, whole, the whole hemisphere. I mean, they took a huge chunk of Mexico, for instance. So this idea of Canada as a colony of the U.S. is, is I think, quite misleading, and it, it ignores Canada's role, privileged role, privileged role, highly privileged role in the world economy. Right? Canada's at the top of the world economy. Five of the 60 biggest banks in the world based in Canada. 0.5% of the world's population. That's tens of times Canada's proportion of the world's population. 50% or more of the world's mining companies are listed or based in Canada. That's a hundred times Canada's proportion of the world's population. The largest privately held private security company, Garda World, Montreal, largest or one of the largest engineering companies in the world, SNC Lavalin, Montreal based. On and on and on and on. Canada is not at the periphery of global capitalism. Canada <coughs> is at the center of global capitalism. Additionally, when we talk about American imperialism, 
we can't ignore the direct benefits that Canadian capital, Canadian corporations, have gained from American imperialism. And I'm not talking just in a general sense, and there's infinite examples in a general sense, in a direct sense. When the Americans took charge of Cuba, the late 1800s, early 1900s, when American banks still had restrictions on their international operations, who became the preferred banker of the American authority? The Royal Bank. Who was the biggest bank in Cuba by the 1920s? The Royal Bank. Similarly, when the Americans took control of Philippines, Bank of Montreal. There are many examples of Canadian capital directly benefiting from American imperial uh, uh, objectives or policies. So I'm of the opinion that, uh, first of all, the Canadian elite has had a privileged position. The Canadian elite has had a privileged position with the two great powers of the past two centuries. Canada has gone from an appendage of the imperial center, Britain, to an appendage of the imperial center, the US. That's how to understand Canada's role in global affairs. And if you don't understand it from that perspective, uh, and the left nationalist perspective that, 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 that ignores that, downplays Canada's power, downplays the role of Canadian capital in exploiting the Caribbean, Mexico, on and on and on. Now, to conclude, to move towards a conclusion, the question is, what do we do? What is a just Canadian foreign policy? How do we get a, bring about that policy? Well, the problem, or one of the problems, with a uh, pushing for a left foreign policy is that all of these example, all of the issues, all of the contexts are, are, you know, they're specific, right? You know, Syria is slightly different than Ukraine, slightly different than Rwanda, slightly different than what, should we do in, what we should be doing with regards to Honduras, on and on and on. And, and in all of the instances, it's pretty far removed from our lives, right? And oftentimes there's a whole lot of propaganda surrounding the, the specific uh, uh, context. So it's, it's hard to say, like, what is a left-wing foreign policy? I think there are some principles that are worth uh, looking at foreign policy or what could be, what should be a left foreign policy from. One of those principles is a pretty general one, but I think a, a useful one to remember is the, the golden rule, um, do unto others as you would have done unto yourself. So if you're not keen on the idea of a foreign co country coming and bombing your country, maybe don't, bomb, don't support bombing another country. Another principle of uh, foreign policy that I think is useful that, to bring into a left foreign policy lens would be the uh, first do no harm principle, borrowing from the medical world. Right? Uh, it, on the surface of it, the idea of first do no harm in foreign policy shouldn't be that controversial. In practice, it is, because our whole political ethos is a do more kind of uh, uh, foreign policy ethos, right? From the NGOs that call for more aid to, the, to the, uh, the liberal internationalists that want more peacekeeping or responsibility to protect to the hard militarists who are just bomb, 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 right? The whole culture kind of pushes in this more. So our first do no harm principle or a lens of looking at foreign policy runs up against uh, those different, uh, that, that political culture. But the first do no harm principle is grounded in international law. It is grounded in, in the idea of uh, self-determination, which is a core principle of the charter, UN charter. It, it's also grounded in, in um, the fact that the supreme international crime, of course, is, is aggression, without war without UN approval. Um, so I think that do, uh, do, uh, the golden rule, first do no harm, are two principles that I think we should be looking at came foreign policy from. Now, more concretely, politically speaking, what do we do? I'm of the opinion that uh, what we do is mostly, mostly just what we already are doing, just a whole lot more of it. Um, it's not very sexy to say that, but that I think is the essence of things. We have, uh, you know, we have in this room uh, people engaged in peace organizations. 
international solidarity organizations, you know, Palestine solidarity, mining and justice groups, uh, Venezuela solidarity groups, uh, on and on and on. And, uh, and we need to basically amplify that work. Maybe in some cases we need to build uh, new groups. Uh, obviously we need to build uh, left-wing media or media that's not totally dependent on, uh, on power and you know, totally uh, biased towards power. But main, mainly, most of what we need to do is, we already sort of know, we just need to do a whole lot more of it. One thing I do suggest in the conclusion of the book is, is something called the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute. People can check that out at foreignpolicy.ca. There should be a sign-up sheet. There isn't actually here one tonight because uh, my last sheet was filled, but people can sign up for the newsletter on the website at foreignpolicy.ca. And basically what the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute is, initially, right now, it's just a repository of critical information on Canadian foreign policy. With time, it will hopefully build into a, an actual functioning left-wing foreign policy think tank that becomes basically the hub of critical information on Canadian foreign policy, produces reports, uh, maybe even has chapters across the country. But initially, it's just a repository of critical information until we can uh, develop some resources uh, to get things going to a, to a greater, greater level. So, we live in a country um, where we have a government and we have institutions, sometimes even left-wing institutions, that are contributing to making people's lives in this world, people who have difficult lives in this world, those lives even more difficult. I think it's a responsibility of people who have a certain degree of freedom, a certain degree of privilege, um, to do what we can to make sure that our government, our political institutions, don't contribute uh, to making people with, who have difficult lives uh, even more difficult. I'll leave it at that. Um, thank you very much.